What is a video game? A magnificent little pile of secrets. In the case of Castlevania, Symphony of the Night. This game indeed has many secrets, as I'll outline in this review. But it's no secret that it's one of the most beloved titles in the Castlevania series. Despite this, I've only played it and beaten it for the first time in 2022, nearly 25 years after its release. I adored the experience. In fact, it made such an impression on me that I felt the need to communicate to the world just why I think this game is so special. Why I think it lives up to its reputation. Yet, while still acknowledging the flaws it has. And so here is my review of Castlevania Symphony of the Night for PlayStation. I'll be attempting to avoid spoiling the game as much as possible throughout my analysis. I myself only just played through it recently for the first time, and I like to preserve and to promote the unguided first playthrough experience. The only other Castlevania game I played before this was Super Castlevania 4, which I beat immediately before this one for the first time. I loved Super Castlevania 4, but I'm still new to the series, and am discovering it now as an adult without any nostalgia affecting my perception of it. I'm ready to provide details about my experience, with reflections on the story, gameplay, visuals, and audio of this game. The story of Symphony of the Night is a direct continuation of the story of Rondo of Blood at the previous game in the series, but introduces you to this saga from an interesting perspective, that of Alucard, the son of Dracula and a human woman. Vampire genes seem to operate by dominant inheritance because Alucard is an ultra-cool vampire dude, which I'll be detailing more later. To summarize the plot, Dracula was killed once four years ago in Rondo of Blood by Richter Belmont, but in Symphony of the Night, which takes place four years after this, Richter has gone missing. Additionally, Maria Renard, also from Rondo of Blood, has gone searching for Richter and has stumbled upon Castlevania, the Castle of Dracula, in her search, which is supposed to appear once every century. Alucard senses something evil afoot and awakens to all this from what was supposed to be an eternal slumber after helping Trevor Belmont defeat Dracula sometime long in the past. That past is Castlevania III, which I haven't played, but realized was nicely referenced in an 8-bit Trevor Belmont sprite inside an Alucard thought bubble in one scene. Do you know the name Richter Belmont? Of the Belmont clan? Of course, but... It was a nice little reference to an older game. It's up to Alucard to investigate what's going on inside Castlevania this time, where the entirety of the game takes place. Without saying too much, know that more than one ending is possible to achieve, and which one you get will depend on your actions. I love this extension of RPG customization to a game's story, as it always further customizes and individualizes the experience to some extent. What makes Alucard an interesting choice for a player character is that he's the son of Dracula, and Dracula is the series-long, centuries-old villain of Castlevania. Alucard also rebels against his father and seems to curse his own undead heritage. He doesn't hold the status of a stereotypical hero. He's the disaffected offspring of evil, intent on having some say in the affairs of his father. Alucard's role in the events of Symphony of the Night further unfold in rare voice-acted cutscenes throughout the game. That's as much detail as I'll describe it and to avoid spoiling it for anybody. This game has a mysterious plot with secrets to discover, and finding out what's going on provides a motivation to keep playing and thoroughly exploring. The story is sparingly narrated in the game, such that I was always excited to watch cutscenes when they occurred. Die, monster! You don't belong in this world! It was not by my hand that I'm once again given flesh. I was called here by humans who wish to pay me tribute. Tribute? You steal men's souls and make them your slaves. Perhaps the same could be said of all religions. Your words are as empty as your soul. 
Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. How about you? <laughs> Storytelling is rather minimal, but the story that's here is intriguing and nicely complements the gameplay experience. And gameplay is where Symphony of the Night truly excels. Symphony of the Night's gameplay is fundamentally that of an action RPG and has two main components, exploration and combat. I'll start by describing the combat, which is quite multifaceted. Starting with the basics, you have a level up system for Alucard and some stats that increase as you level up, including HP, MP, attack, defense, strength, constitution, and luck. You can see these stats on a single screen when you pause the game. You also have a meter for hearts, the droppable items that function as fuel for all special weapons, such as axes, knives, and holy water. The game's manual makes it sound like strength and attack both affect attack power, and also like the defense and constitution stats both affect defense. However, it doesn't clearly distinguish them, nor does it describe all the effects of luck. My working explanations are that strength and constitution are Alucard's base stats, but that attack and defense are the effective stats that take into account the stat boosts gained by equipped gear. However, the differences between them remains vague in the gamer manual. This minor weakness didn't really affect my gameplay in a negative way, but it still would have been nice if the game further explained and distinguished these stats from one another. Speaking of gear, let's talk about the things you can equip in this RPG. Alucard has equipment slots for one piece of torso armor, a head armor, and a cape, plus two accessory slots for things like rings that provide extra effects or stat boosts. There are also slots for the right and left hands, which are nicely mapped to the square and circle buttons. You can equip any combination of single-handed weapons you find in each hand, and choose to carry a shield in one hand if you like. The exception to this rule is two-handed weapons, which don't allow any second weapon or shield. Most equipment can be found as drops from candles or enemies you destroy, or will be hidden in secret rooms throughout the castle. Though you do find one person later who sells a nice variety of gear. That gear can be bought with gold that is scattered throughout the castle as drops, like the hearts that feel special weapons. The gear you equip typically affects your offensive or defensive power in combat, but some equipment grants special abilities that can at times even be important for advancing in certain parts of the castle. I'd recommend new players to pay attention to the names and descriptions of equipment, because it may just provide a clue to how you're supposed to progress at times. Alucard's equipment affects him in a couple other cool ways. The cloak you have equipped will usually have a unique color that Alucard's in-game sprite will display, and different weapons look, sound, and swing differently. The varied sound effects of different weapons are cool enough, but I also loved the depth of slightly different movesets found with each weapon. For example, a sword will swing with a different attack animation than a mace, and will more easily connect with certain enemies. Special items returned from older Castlevania games, including familiar things like the axe and knife, but also introducing some new and awesome ones like the Agunea, which shoots lightning and kind of made me feel like I was using a taser on the forces of darkness. You can equip only one special weapon at a time, and there are nine of them in total in the game. I tried all of them and found each of them to be highly useful on at least one occasion. Some were more versatile than others, but each of them helped me with specific situations. It was helpful to have a diverse arsenal to choose from, because the enemies you encounter are pretty diverse in their movement patterns. But the depth of this game's combat doesn't even stop here. You also have access to a handful of spells that can be purchased for gold. Spells use up your blue MP meter, which simply recovers over time after being drained. I didn't even find all the spells in the game, but the few I did were a lot of fun, especially when I found enemies that were particularly vulnerable to them. Spells are the most complicated actions you can perform in the game, utilizing the fighting game style commands combining directional pad sequences with a button press. There isn't anything too complicated, but you may on rare occasion fail to nail the correct input to execute a spell. It's nothing as hard as executing special attacks in a King of Fighters game though, and I usually didn't have too much trouble executing them on the spot. 
Some of the spells even allow modification or extension of their effects in battle, depending on what additional inputs you follow up the basic command with. So there's some nice gameplay depth here to really learn and get good at that I honestly didn't come close to mastering in my first and only playthrough. The combat gets even better though, because there's another factor you get to mix in. Familiars. You don't find most of the familiars until a little later in the game, but they're a nice additional layer of customization to the combat. Put simply, the familiar you choose to set as active functions as a little sidekick or assistant for Alucard. Each familiar gains experience and new abilities by leveling up, and each has its own particular ways in which it can help you. Most of them have unique fighting abilities and help you dispatch enemies, but the fairy doesn't seem to fight at all and instead offers you hints and secrets in the environment you explore and occasionally may heal you. The familiars don't have their own status screens, however, so there isn't really any way to easily compare the abilities or stats of different familiars in the game. A minor drawback. I should also mention that Alucard has a status that can be changed by enemy-inflicted status conditions. I don't have a ton to say about these because they were a minor impact on my gameplay. I found that status conditions like being poisoned or stoned eh, wore off quickly enough that I never even needed to use status recovery items available in the game once. One last ability system I have to mention are relics. Relics are particularly rare one-time pickups you find in specific places that grant Alucard a diverse array of abilities, and most of these provide passive abilities that are essential for traversing or accessing certain parts of the castle. You have a relic menu where you can see what each relic does and set each to on or off. All of them can be kept on all of the time, with the exception of relics for your familiars. These you have to equip one at a time since you can only have one familiar active at a time. My only complaint is that some relics don't come with clear instructions of how to execute the abilities they unlock. I was able to figure out through experimentation how to use enough relics to blindly play through the game without guidance until the credits rolled, but it still would have been nice to have more detailed descriptions for some of Alucard's special transformation abilities. Like with the lack of good stat explanations or familiar stat screens, these mechanics are just left a little vague by the game and instruction manual. As I transition from discussing combat to exploration, let me address the controls of the game, which are important for both of those things. I played this PS1 game on my PS2 Slim using a nice arcade stick controller I have for PS2, but I also tested on a traditional PlayStation controller. The controls are simple enough to instantly pick up and play and are responsive with either controller option I tried. Move with directional buttons, or arcade controller analog stick in my case, Jump with X, attack or shield with square or circle, and execute a nimble backstep with triangle. The shoulder buttons are used for Alucard's transformations that are accessed a little later in the game. Select instantly opens or closes your map, and start brings up the menu from which you view Alucard's status, spells, relics, and familiars. Alucard controls with precision and is able to maneuver around the castle and enemies with deft elegance. The backstep was a particularly nice and enjoyable addition to Castlevania gameplay. It was fun using it to dodge enemy attacks before counterattacking. Alucard's jumping feels much freer and almost float-like compared to the way Simon Belmont falls like a rock in older games, particularly once the double jump ability is obtained. Gravity just doesn't weigh Alucard down like it does a Belmont. Alucard also walks a little faster than Simon. Apparently being half vampire gives you a nicely paced power walk. Once you gain transformation abilities, the ability to transform between them on the fly can be combined with your typical Alucard abilities to beautifully and seamlessly traverse all over the castle as befits a vampire. Your ability to move around the castle just gets better and better the further you adventure into it. Symphony of the Night shines just as much in its exploration as it does in its combat. One might think that setting this game's entire environment in a single castle could limit how fun or diverse the exploration could be, but the castle has been given enough varied sections with unique scenery, architecture, and hazards that I never felt bored exploring this game. From caverns to sections of the castle that showed a little bit of lush outside scenery or the moon, there was always something cool to see everywhere I went. Sometimes I was just in awe of the unique and imaginative new enemies I found in various places. 
and at all times I found myself with multiple paths to explore. This game is structured such that you continuously find new abilities which continuously provide you access to more and more parts of the castle. The nooks and crannies to discover seemed almost endless, and I constantly was able to revisit old areas with new abilities that unlocked sometimes incredibly expansive new regions. The game is overbrimming with secrets, such as concealed destructible walls that may hide items or passages to rooms that don't even appear on your map. While the map shows most unexplored and explored parts of the castle, it doesn't show you everything, and this keeps exploring unpredictable and exciting even with the generally helpful guidance of the map still kept intact. These hidden areas do get filled in on the map once they are discovered. The incredible amount of secrets to be found here enhances the castle's mysterious atmosphere and also makes the game more fun and replayable. One thing that stood out to me about the exploration of this 2D game is how well Symphony makes use of both of its two directions in level design. There are some 2D games like the classic Mario platformers where the player largely just moves horizontally across a stage, but in Symphony, verticality is just as much a factor as horizontality. Expect to be traveling almost just as much on the Y axis as you are on the X axis in this game. You'll find both horizontal and vertical corridor type rooms, but also some more open areas that provide a lot of room for movement in both directions. Traversing the castle is made quicker with a few interconnected teleportation points scattered throughout it and the occasional save point, which is useful not just for saving progress but also recovering HP to full. Save points appear frequently enough to provide checkpoints when needed and are well placed to eliminate long walks to boss fights that may cause multiple game overs. This is good, since dying completely loses all progress made since the last save point and is equivalent to turning your console's power off mid-game. This is a game from before the age of autosaving, so save when you can. I'll make a brief note about the inventory system of the game. It works fine with no issues to speak of. All your items, from weapons to hunks of roast beef you can find hidden in walls, go into one single list, and I never seem to even come close to having any annoying problem like running out of inventory space. Maybe the inventory could have benefited from some subdivisions for equipment and consumable items, but I really have no major complaints here. I've now laid out all the details of what comprises Symphony of the Night's gameplay and it might sound like the game's systems are a little overwhelming between the special items, spells, familiars, and relics. It does mix together a decent diversity of mechanics, but they never overwhelmed me because each individual system is kept fairly simple, and they are introduced gradually. I didn't really even have to think about familiars or spells until I was a few hours into the game. Overall, these systems combined to create a fair amount of RPG customization and room for individuality in my gameplay style, and it's this sort of customizability that draws me to RPGs so much. What's fantastic about Symphony of the Night is that it also allows high customization of how the player explores and progresses in the game. Other than some limitation on where you can adventure early due to lacking many abilities, you can choose to forge your own unique path through the castle and it's not only possible but likely that you'll find yourself on at least one occasion somewhere where you perhaps shouldn't be and are a bit low level to handle. The uncertainty of not knowing when I was going to stumble into these areas was thrilling and appropriate for a game based on the Dracula legend, kind of like blindly wandering in the dark. It was fun being surprised by the next huge and grotesque monster or crowd of monsters and adjusting my diverse set of equipment and abilities to handle each challenge. Speaking of challenge, this game has a gradually increasing difficulty, not unlike Super Castlevania 4. Early enemies and bosses are mostly not too hard, though I would say maybe one out of three bosses in the game killed me at least once. I died to some later bosses many times. The main difference here from a Castlevania game like Super Castlevania 4 is where the source of the difficulty lies. Super Castlevania 4 kills you with platforming and unforgiving areas filled with instant death traps and pits. Symphony, in contrast, doesn't have a single trap or fall that I could find that kills Alucard instantly. In fact, Alucard doesn't take any fall damage at all and you can't die from falling in this game. Platforming is rarely a real challenge or a lethal hazard here. Instead, the hazards are chiefly found in the enemies you encounter. 
The deadliest situations I've found in the game are usually found in rooms that throw a lot of enemies at you simultaneously. I also struggled with little birds and other small flying enemies at times. Endless bird barrage. Err. Uh, leave me alone. No, no, no. Not the birds. Not the birds. Ah. But there's always a special weapon or ability that can make these challenges more manageable. And there's enough balance in your arsenal to exercise some freedom and choice in what tools you want to use to overcome them. I never had to break the flow of my gameplay with level grinding a single time thanks to the non-linear flexibility of progression in Symphony. If any particular boss gave me trouble for too long, I simply went and explored somewhere else, leveling up a bit more until I was ready to return to those difficult enemies. The marriage of non-linear exploration and RPG leveling mechanics is quite a harmonious one, as the gradual level ups accumulate with even every weak enemy dispatched, and no battle is worthless. Each builds your ability to explore even more and take down greater adversaries blocking your way. This is an example of a game's systems working together in harmony to create a sum greater than the parts. I grew up during the PS1's generation, though I didn't have a PS1 or PS2 until I bought them as an adult. Since experiencing the revolutionary shift from 2D to 3D gaming as a kid with the N64, it's actually taken me a long time to appreciate and accept the idea of a powerful 3D capable console being used to host a merely 2D game. The visuals of Symphony prove to me that 2D games are truly worth this treatment, however. There's a level of exquisite artistry on display here that demands a more powerful 3D capable console like the original PlayStation at minimum, and truly wouldn't be possible on an older system like the Super Nintendo which championed, some say even perfected, 2D graphics. Symphony's graphics are lush with detail, color, and style. Alcar's animation is natural and fluid. The sprite's every movement is also followed by what I can best describe as an afterimage that's hypnotic to watch. As Alucard walks around and gracefully descends downward from a jumper fall, his hair and cape drift and cascade realistically behind him. Certain special items can put on a light show, like with the green flames of the holy water or the lightning bolts of the Agunea. And when it comes to enemy designs, I have to say that this game's enemies have presented one of the most enjoyable parades of monstrosities and abominations I've ever beheld in a video game. What I love, and this seems to be a trait of the Castlevania series more broadly, is that a menagerie of creatures from classic horror films and stories are represented, and represented well. Enemy diversity is high. I was constantly encountering interesting and unique new enemies as I progressed throughout the game and no boss or enemy was ever reused or recycled with a different color palette once. There were also a few monsters to be found in the game that aren't exactly things I would ever have imagined, and definitely haven't ever seen anywhere else in horror or dark fantasy, so the game gets extra points for them. I was consistently thrilled to witness the various enemies generally, but must give specific attention to the unique behaviors and death animations of different enemies. Some just explode when defeated, but others do far more elaborate things when they're slain that make them more distinct and amusing to encounter and defeat. A few death animations are gloriously bloody, including Alucard's own death animation. There are also some gargantuan enemy and boss sprites here and there which look amazing. I think the game's explosions and fire effects look great, and hitting enemies is indicated by the enemy's sprite flashing colorfully as well as by displaying the amount of damage your attack does, once a relic is obtained which allows this. This may be a good time to mention the fact that you also need to find another relic in order to make the name of an enemy display on the screen while you're attacking it. One could argue that these simple features would best be unlocked from the game's start by default, but it's not really a big deal. These relics are easy enough to find early with a little bit of exploring. Elaborating on visuals, the environments mostly treated me to traditional but well-detailed 2D graphics, but there was also some dynamic movement, such as fast-moving clouds to be seen in some areas, and some sparse but well-implemented 3D background models to provide depth and perspective in a few places. Colors on display tended to be darker, befitting the dark story and setting of the game, but color palettes shift nicely between warmer or cooler colors depending on the particular place you may be in. The library, for instance, features lots of yellow and orange colors that are warm and cozy, 
but other areas exude more forbidding atmosphere with dark hues of purple, red, and blue accenting the sky or elaborate decorations in the castle. The combinations of colors found in specific places like the chapel or Colosseum contributed to how memorable those locations were. I've been a musician for about the same amount of time as I've been into video games, which is to say, most of my life. That being the case, I have a high degree of appreciation for great soundtracks and games, and I'm very happy to say that Symphony of the Night doesn't disappoint in this area. Its marvelous soundtrack is one of the things that made playing it so very memorable and enjoyable. It's quite fitting that the game is called Symphony of the Night, and I thought it would be also fun to just see what an old dictionary published decades before the game has to say about the definition of symphony. Let's see. Symphony, a consonance or harmony of sounds, especially of instrumental sounds. Consonance or harmony of any kind. An instrumental passage in a vocal composition. An instrumental movement in the midst of a chorale work, such as the Pastoral Symphony in the Messiah of Handel. An elaborate instrumental composition in sonata form for a full orchestra. I suppose all this fits well enough. However, I would go further in describing the soundtrack of Symphony of the Night. I would describe it as an auspicious aural amalgamation of melody and rhythm into a listenable, intricate tapestry of melancholic interludes that cast an enchanting and entrancing musical spell over the entire journey of the game. In other words, it's pretty good. Basically, every element of a good game soundtrack is here. You've got good sound quality. You've got good diversity of compositions and instrumentation. You've got catchiness and also just cohesion with the visual aesthetics and setting of the game. It's just about perfect. You'll find an eclectic mix of music genres represented here, with classical or orchestral sounding pieces being most common. While streaming the game and playing the audio through my audio interface and studio monitor headphones, it sounded like a real orchestra, sometimes complete with a choir was performing. I'd even say some of these tracks would fit a real-life opera or ballet. Appropriately, melodies and keys shy away from happy-sounding major modes, and are more often minor and melancholic. Rock and even metal show up in some tracks, and I enjoyed the sick electric guitar that sounded like it came straight out of an 80s metal album. Instrument samples, percussion in particular, sounded pretty great to me, and I enjoyed the occasional track which mixed rock or metal drum kits and beats with more traditional and classical instruments like strings and organ. This was almost like hybrid classical rock music. Jazz makes a definite presence in some songs, with the music playing in the Colosseum veering into some incredibly infectious Latin jazz. Aside from this, there's also a few minimalistic and dissonant mood-setting soundscapes used sparingly as well. I found the soundtrack to be an overwhelmingly strong one overall. This is some of the finest music I've ever heard in any video game, and it'll stick with me forever now that I've spent just a few hours playing this game that it took for me to beat it a single time. Speaking of which, if going by the time recorded on my save file, it took me around 15 hours to beat Symphony of the Night. However, I can verify that I spent another 5 or so hours on top of that in lost progress that ended in my deaths, so I really spent closer to 20 hours beating the game. This was while playing blind for the first time and without looking up any sort of guide. I should also mention that this is how long it took me to achieve a second ending to the game after I initially got the credits to roll in a way I suspected wasn't the truest or most satisfying of conclusions possible. However, it was fairly straightforward for me to at least achieve that first basic ending on my own. The actions necessary to progress to a better ending get a little cryptic, but not too bad. Just remember what I said about paying attention to equipment names and descriptions. At the very least, I was able to get the credits to roll in some fashion without too much trouble, which I think is a successful result to the test of playing any game blind without guidance. It means the game isn't too impossibly cryptic to figure out. Ultimately, the fact that more than one ending is possible adds to the many other secrets of Symphony of the Night, and it gives the game even more mystery, depth, and replay value. 
Though storytelling is not a major focus of Symphony, there are a handful of voice acted cutscenes in the game as I mentioned before. One could argue that the dialogue is cheesy, but I for one think the voice actors do a great job portraying their characters, and I thoroughly enjoy their performances. Some line delivery feels perhaps overacted, but in truth I can't imagine anything less than overacting ever working for a Castlevania game. I'll not ask you to return to our side, but I demand you cease your attack. I will not. You shall regret those words. We will meet again. Does a game with vampire hunters, vampires, zombies, and animated skeletons call for subtlety? I'd lean towards no. That finally wraps up most of what I have to say about Symphony of the Night. For whatever reason, this moment in my adult life was the right time for me to play this game. I find myself increasingly drawn to darker themes, aesthetics, and settings in the media I consume the older I get, and Castlevania games immerse one in that sort of style. I just really like dark fantasy and horror, I guess. On top of that, this game delivers a fun and customizable array of RPG mechanics to tune, level up progression, and a soundtrack that's to die for. This combination of traits is particularly irresistible to me in the games I play. Its biggest drawback is probably that it lacks transparency and descriptive detail for some of its mechanics as I outlined regarding the relics and familiars, but this sort of vagueness was pretty common in games back in 1997. This criticism is really centered just on the knowledge the game shares with you or lack thereof and not on the gameplay experience it treats you to. And the gameplay experience is incredibly strong. I realize this game has already attracted a lot of attention and earned a famous reputation, but it just made such an impression on me with my first playthrough that I had to make my own contribution to its analytical canon. In doing so, I hope I articulated the reasons why I think it's special, and offered someone somewhere a new reason to take interest in the game. It's not to be missed if you like amazing 2D action RPG gameplay and appreciate dark fantasy given life with stellar visual and audio presentation. So let us go out this evening for pleasure. The night is still young, and the symphony of the night is timeless.